But it's very important, you know, we let Paul be Paul rather than turn Paul into our own image or, or Jesus for that matter or Peter or anyone. Hi, I'm Rachel Bomberger with Erdman's Publishing. I'm here with Michael Bird, who is author of the new book, An Anomalous Jew, Paul Among Jews, Greeks, and Romans. Hello, Michael. Hello, Rachel. Wonderful you could join us. You start your book, An Anomalous Jew, with an exploration of all the different ways that people understand Paul in his context. Paul is a bit of an enigma, isn't he? Oh, definitely, definitely. And uh, a lot of people can see in Paul their favorite villain or their favorite, you know, religious hero, and they can uh, they can clone him in his own image. And uh, when you think about, you know, how does Paul relate to Judaism to other Jewish people? Uh, there's been a lot to be said, and a lot of people have had a uh, you know their own view on that. And they want someone to make Paul thoroughly Jewish, or someone to make him you know, a little bit Jewish, but you know, not that Jewish. Or someone to make him a, a Christian, um, you know, or that sort of thing. Um, so there's, there's in the history of scholarship, there's been a lot of ways of situating Paul in relation to Israel, to the law, the Torah, and how do you construct and understand his own Jewish identity and his own, you know, mission to the Gentiles uh, in light of his own Jewish heritage. You call him in the first chapter. You call him a Jew of sorts. A Jew of sorts. Yeah. What what options or, or what different approaches have people taken to understanding his relation to his own Jewish heritage? Yeah, well, some can see Paul as almost like an ex-Jew. Like Paul characterizes Judaism basically as Pharisaism, and uh, and the idea is that at his conversion, he pretty much left Pharisaic Judaism, and he's now doing this sort of um, uh, Messiah-centered. Uh, religion, which is continuous and discontinuous with Judaism. Others say Paul retains his Judaism, but he tries to transcend its its ethnocentrality. So he still has a lot of the uh, inherited privileges, or maybe probably better to say he has a, a lot of the uh, religious baggage of it, but he's sort of you know taking the ethnic element out of it. And then th those who want to say, no, Paul was a good and faithful Jew his whole life, and believing in Jesus and taking Jesus to the Gentile was not in any way a departure from that. So there's different ways of, of, of relating Paul to the Jewish world and to the Jewish people. And as you can imagine, it stirs quite a lot of, of debate and very frank discussion. Oh, certainly. And you come in and say that Paul is an anomalous Jew. What yep. does that mean? Yeah, well, first of all, I should uh, point out, I got the, the actual phrase from John Barclay, because mm -hmm. his excellent book about the, uh, uh, the Jews in the Mediterranean diaspora. And he pulls out, you know, Paul is a very interesting character because on the one hand, uh, Paul is having the same struggle as other diaspora Jews. He's trying to negotiate his way in the Mediterranean context, where it's you know, largely a, a, a Greco-Roman world, you know, Roman power, Greek religion and culture. And like other diaspora Jews, he certainly grates against that. He's, he's, he's repulsed by the idolatry, by the, the sexual ethics, by the, the temples, by the paganism, and he, he really dislikes it and is allergic to it. But at the same time, He's also doing that with some other resources. He, he believes that it's in the Messiah's death and resurrection that God has ushered in the end of ages. In other words, the, the, we've approached the beginning of the end and God's, God's plan to repossess the world for himself has been unleashed in this, which, which, which then leads him to do some things that other Jews wouldn't do, or not many Jews would do, and that is he wants to bring Gentiles into uh, the body of people who are being saved. I, I think he wants to see them into a, a reconstituted Israel that's built up of both Jews and believing Gentiles, unified by the Messiah and by the Spirit, and that makes him stand out. So he, on, the, on the one hand, he is a, 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 a diaspora Jew, but he's got these little anomalous beliefs and praxis that make him stand out and then he kind of guts offside of everyone, Roman authorities, um, Greek philosophers, uh, Jews uh, and Jewish Christians and, and Palestinian leaders and all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yes, his, his context, we're not only trying to place him within the Jewish community, mm. but also within this broader Greco-Roman society, mm. and he doesn't fit neatly in any any one category, does he? No, no, he doesn't. And you know, one of the big debates has been uh, Paul's relationship to the Roman Empire. Mm. And there's, you know, one way of looking at it that says basically Paul regarded the Roman Empire as pretty much a non-entity, 
or else that Paul was actually very grateful for the Roman Empire. It, it, it provided the security, the means of travel, uh, the advantages of citizenship and all that. And he was, he was quite dependent upon the Roman um, uh, uh, peace and prosperity that he brought in order for his mission. And then you get others who basically want, who want to paint Paul as a kind of like a, a 1960s radical, you know, <laughs> who, who was wandering around um, Rome saying, you know, occupy Caesar now, that type of thing, or, or saying hashtag revolution. And so there's all different ways of putting Paul in relation to the empire. Um, I, I do think there is a little sort of anti-imperial edge to what Paul is doing. But I think that's implicit on the worldview is inherited because the Jewish religion, I think, was inherently anti-pagan and pagan politics and religion were always bound up together. Mm. And, and I think Paul construes that in certain ways that it's certainly not his main thing. But if you read between the lines, if you, if you, if you follow the trajectory of what he's saying, I think he does become a little bit counter-imperial. And what I tend to say in the book is I don't think Paul was going to lead an angry mob up the Palatine Hill. Um, you know, um, saying, you know, six semper tyrannis, you know, always down with tyrants. But at the same time, he wouldn't be happy standing in a stadium with his hand on his heart, singing Laudes Imperi, which is kind of like, you know, long live the empire type of thing. Uh, so, you know, I think, I think he was sort of orientated towards, oh, sorry, against the empire, but he, he, wasn't, he wasn't a political activist. That was not his main game. What do we gain when we stop trying to put Paul in a box and just let him be as he is, as messy and complicated as yeah, he is. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the important is, you know, first of all, it's the boxes you, that you bring. And like, you know, if, if I said to you, uh, are you a, you know, compassionate, loving, decent, caring person who helps the poor or, and, you know, looks after your neighbor, feeds your cat, or a Trump supporter? I um, mean, you know, you could like, you might, it's like if someone asked a question like that, you say, well, well, hang on, for a start, are those two things contradictory? I mean, I'm sure there are Trump supporters who feed their cat and do nice things. And secondly, are they the only options? Um, more often than not, we, 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 we come with these sort of dichotomies where the answer can be, uh, is often more messier because as we know from our own experience, people are complex in themselves. People are messy. And, and, and also people can be inconsistent or they can develop and they can grow in different directions. And that's why we, we've really got to uh, look at Paul and, and you know, try to understand him on his own terms and how he would be seen in his own day. And certainly from that, then we can think about what he means for our own contemporary context. How do we appropriate Paul uh, for our own time? Look at the history of reception, what we can learn from that. But it's very important, you know, we let Paul be Paul rather than turn Paul into our own image or, or Jesus for that matter, or Peter or anyone. Mm -hmm. So you've written a book about this. Yes. An anomalous Jew. What do you hope people take away from the book and how do you hope it will be used? I hope it will be used a, a number of ways. I think this book would be great for professors and students who want a little bit of an, uh, of an entree or an appetizer into what's happening in Pauline studies these days. So I think the book is very valuable in that sense of saying, okay, what, what are people saying about Paul? And I, I think I give a, a pretty thorough um, survey of research, certainly in the footnotes. I've tried to give like these really big mother of all footnotes trying to quote everyone as I can to give little brief tidbits of research. And I also engage some of the really big debates about you know, Pauline studies these days. And one of them is Paul and empire, um, you know, Paul within Judaism, and also um, Paul in relation to you know, uh, apocalyptic uh, theology. So I try to go into those sort of debates and, and um, show what the issues are and then you know, try to nail my own colors to the mask where I think appropriate. Or uh, well, giving what I think are the right answers, but that will be for other people to decide. <laughs> well, I'm very glad that uh, you wrote the book and that you're here to talk with us today. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.